One yeah. of the things that I've, I'm really fascinated by is there's been a big conversation recently around ACL injuries in sport. Yeah. And from reading your work, it seems that, and just doing some research online, it seems that this increase in women getting ACL injuries links somewhat to this Q angle situation, which again is the, I don't know how to explain it for someone that is listening on audio and can't see, but I will link it in this description. So I highly recommend you look at this picture because the minute you see it, it makes a ton of sense. But it's essentially like, and this is me probably butchering it. Yeah. As a man, because my hips don't widen, my legs are effectively quite straight. Yep. So from my hip down to my toes, it's quite straight, which means that I'm going to be more sturdy. Say if I jump up in the air, when I land, this I know this because my dad's an engineer, the center of gravity being straight means that I'm less likely to get injured. But if you're, is that right? right? Yeah, because your forces are going to be in a more linear fashion. So you have more... Um, even distribution of the force through the knee. Mm -hmm. But for women, as you're going to describe, our hips are wider, so we have more of an angle to the knee, and the forces aren't distributed evenly when we land. So when we look at that, as well as the quad dominance that develops for women. because What's quad dominance? So that means that we use our um, front muscles of our legs, our quads, a lot more than our hamstrings, our posterior chain. So we don't use our glutes and our hamstrings by default um, as well as men do. So we're being pulled forward more and we, let, we put more emphasis on the front of our body mm. um, because those – tend to take the the quads, tend to take the bulk of the muscle work that we're trying to do, unless we're really trying to train hamstrings and glutes to fire, which isn't the default for women's bodies because center of gravity again is lower and you tend to lean forward. So when we're looking at ACL injury, again, it comes down to one, training stress, two, mechanics. And if we're not taught again how to land, how to run, how to jump with the new angles, it predisposes people to severe ACL injury. And how much more likely is a woman to have an ACL injury than a man? It is a higher rate, but the thing about the research is that there hasn't been a direct comparison because we hear incidentally that women tear their ACL. And so we see a lot of observational studies that women have torn their ACL. And we have lots of retrospective studies that are going back to, oh, where are we in our menstrual cycle when we tore ACL? But there hasn't been a definitive comparison between men and women. If we were to look at the current research, we see a three to four to one ratio of ACL tears of women versus men. So Three to four. So. so either three to one or four to one, depending on the research that you look. So three women for every one man or four women for every one man. Okay, so a 300% difference. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. I know, absolutely never knew that. And in fact, it wasn't until I was looking through your work that I, I'd seen, um, I went and did some research and there's a big conversation online a lot of sort of news coverage around women's football because it's yeah. I think it's the fastest growing sport in the world. Yep. But I read that this, the probability that a woman tears her ACL muscle is significantly, like hundreds of percent more likely than a man because of this, in part because of this Q angle. In professional sport, it's not as much as when we're looking at recreational sport. Because when we get into professional sport, we have specific warm-ups, especially for football, um, put out by FIFA to prevent ACL tear, to make sure um, that you are actually properly warmed up and engaging the right muscles and learning how to stop pivot because it's a it's a, a mechanism in action usually is a twisting angle. But if we're looking at more age group or grassroots sports, because people aren't aware of this Q angle, they aren't aware of the quad dominance, women haven't been taught again how to work with these new mechanics, then we're seeing a greater incidence of ACL tear. 30 female football players missed Women's World Cup in 2023 due to ACL injuries, including in the UK, Lioness, Beth Mead, and Leah Williamson, mm -hmm. um, which is staggering to me. Yeah, it's very high incidence, yeah. So is there something that can be done if you're a woman that's exercising, that's doing things like jumping and running and sprinting and the fast sort of twitch uh, sports? Is there something you can do to avoid having an ACL injury? It's all about being strong. So if we're looking at how, what is the biggest thing for ACL prevention, and I'll bring in one of my PhD students that's graduated, looked at um, ACL rehab after surgery. 
and it comes down to the definitive difference between quad and hamstring strength. So if we're looking at improving the um, strength capacity of the hamstrings, then it offsets some of the default strength that the quads are taking. So if we're able to balance it from being front loaded to being more even loaded, it comes down to, you know, how we were talking about distribution of forces through the knee with men being more linear and women having an angle. Well, if we're able to take that angle and we can evenly distribute the load between the muscles of the hamstring and the quads to the front and the back, yeah. then it pulls the forces more centrally, okay. which reduces the stress of one point of contact. Got you. So if we're developing the strength through the whole posterior chain, we're looking at glutes, we're looking at hamstrings, we're doing a lot of calf work, and we can develop that whole posterior part. It reduces the incidence of being pulled in one direction and the misalignment of forces. The other is the cutting motion, where we're looking at, at um, lateral movement. So a lot of times when we're looking at warm-ups and you're observing on like kids sports, there's not a lot of lateral development. So if we're looking at, at um, prevent, prevention of ACL tear, we have to work a lot of the explosive lateral movements as well as jumping and single leg, single leg jumping. And these are things that aren't really done in grassroots, but as we start to get more into professional sport, it's becoming more and more apparent that we have to do specific mechanism of injury prevention. So they're looking at the sport. We're a football player. We have a high incidence of ACL potential. So we have to really develop our posterior chain. We have to work on our power for our lateral movements, our step and our jump. Um, so this is part of what FIFA's put in for the warm-up because there is such a draw. And as you're saying, that 33 women in the World Cup tore their ACL. Part of it is loading. Part of it is a little bit maybe overtrained before they go into the World Cup. But a lot of it has to do with um, this imbalance between the muscles and now having to address it. Did science just look at women as a different version of men? Like, yeah. a, sorry, did they just look at women as like a smaller version of men? Is that what how they looked? Yeah, for the most part. Because I mean, a lot of the stuff when I was going through school and even now textbooks. So I was standing in the metro in DC. Uh, a few months ago and there was a young girl who has just gotten into exercise physiology and I overheard a conversation and she was talking about some of the experiments that they were doing, but it never, she never talked about like, we have to make, uh, you know, we're doing women specific, we're doing men specific. And I asked her, I was like, has anyone, you know, talked to you about how women's bodies are different than men's from angles and muscle morphology. And she's like, no, what are you talking about? I was like, this is a second year in x -Viz now. And if you look at the textbooks, it's still a representation of men in the textbook with regards to images. You have him or they, you never have her. They might have a very small section in there about the female athlete, but usually it's about the female athlete and anemia or relative energy deficiency in sport. It's never about how we can empower women to use their bodies and their physiology to their advantage. And it's what, almost 2025 now. Is there any element of it of people being too scared to talk about differences in physiology amongst men and women? I don't think so. I mean, I always explain it from historical perspective. When we're looking at the history and when we started seeing the modernization of medicine. Prior to the modernization of medicine, it used to be women who were the caretakers. If you're thinking about you get sick, you go and someone has an herbal remedy for you. But when we started medicalizing and becoming more nuanced in the medical education, women were excluded. So when we start looking at, at the origins of medicine and who was in the room, it was men. When we start looking at the origins of science and science development, it was men. So all the scientific experiments and everything have always been a default to men. We look at AI now, and they're learning from algorithms based on male data. So even now, healthcare is still heavily male-oriented. So when we start looking at why women haven't been included or why women have been generalized to male data, it's just been the nature of how things have developed. Now that we're aware of it, and now we have more research money coming into women's health, we're starting to see a change. And part of the two definitive moments in healthcare research that really invoked this change, one was when we started seeing a lot of incidences with Ambien and the dosage of medicines where women were getting into a lot of accidents, car accidents, 
after they had taken Ambien because it was still in their system the next morning. It's Ambien. It's a sleep aid. Okay. It's a, a prescription strength sleep aid. So then people are like, whoa, what's going on here? Oh, the dosage for a 180-pound man is the same as a 120-pound woman. And we also know that there's differences in body composition and metabolism. So a a 180-pound man can take this dose and be fine in the morning, but a 120-pound woman can't take that same dose and be fine in the morning. And then we have COVID and the outcomes of um, long COVID and the differences between the sexes with regards to women ended up with more long COVID, men ended up dying. So then during the COVID time period, People were like, whoa, there's sex differences in the outcomes of this disease. We have to really start looking at that. So there's slow things that are really impactful on society that now people are starting to step and say, wait, we have to really look at women as women. We have to look at men as men. And is there an element of hormones impacting injury at all? There's always an uh, uh, an impact of hormones when we're looking at at the overlay of hormones and sex hormones, and then the protocols that have been developed, they don't take into account estrogen, progesterone, and to some extent, testosterone. So if we're looking at injury and the way that estrogen makes more um, laxative ligaments, so that means that our ligaments become more lax when estrogen comes up, which is why people assume that around ovulation is when people will have more ACL tears. It's not because we also see that progesterone comes in and can have a different effect on the tendons. But that isn't accounted for in a lot of of the protocols that are out there for training and prevention of overtraining. We see that when we're looking at male and testosterone, there tends to be the more testosterone, the better for developing muscle and recovery. But that's not necessarily true either. So there's nuances in the sociocultural idea around sex hormones that also impact on our actual guidelines and protocols. 